Welcome to Ingredient Insiders. I'm John Magazzino. And I'm Andrea Parkins. Each week, a new chef joins us to talk about their favorite ingredient. And we also talk to the suppliers, producers, and vendors who make those ingredients and talk about why they're so special and why they end up in chef's kitchens. Andrea, this week we've got Natasha Pickowitz coming in to talk about vanilla, one of the foundational ingredients for pastry chefs. I kind of think of vanilla as almost like the umami of pastry. Like it's kind of the back note of so many pastry you know, cookies, croissants, like everything. When I think about vanilla, I think about whipped cream. I don't know why. I think that's the thing I use it most often for. Like ice cream or like... Well, I love vanilla ice cream. No, but I'm saying when I use it at home, I love to have fresh vanilla pods. I love to scrape them out. I love to add that to like heavy cream when I'm whipping it. Mm -hmm. But I don't really use vanilla outside of vanilla extract, which I'll use to make, you know, chocolate chip cookies or things like that. What else do you, are you using vanilla for? I've seen vanilla used in sweet and savory applications, which I think is kind of cool. I've seen vanilla as part of a rub on uh, different like meats and, and proteins. Yep. Immediately when you say vanilla, I think of vanilla ice cream. It's like very nostalgic. It like reminds me of my childhood. Now that you say these things, I do use vanilla beans to make rice pudding. I've got a cookbook mm -hmm. from the chef Alan Ducasse, and he's got this incredible, really rich, creamy rice pudding that he uses vanilla. You know, you got to you got to scrape out the little mm -hmm. seeds or the caviar, as a lot of people call it, from the vanilla bean to make this rice pudding. It's fantastic. Vanilla is one of the most expensive ingredients that we sell at Chef's Warehouse. And, you know, in, in researching and learning about it, it's because it's so rare. It's only grown in such specific parts of the country. Uh, that it's kind of this like jewel. It's super rare. Yeah. For, I mean, I wasn't aware that you could even get vanilla beans from anywhere other than Madagascar, mm -hmm. which is kind of a remote spot as far as I'm concerned, um, or Tahiti. Yep, the Tahitian. Which, I don't know why we're not doing this episode, actually, you know, live recording from, from Tahiti. Tahiti. That, would, that would, be would be a fun awesome. one. But I have recently learned that it is, a, you know, they do grow vanilla beans in Mexico. I don't think they grow it anywhere in the United States. I just don't think the climate No, I don't think it needs it. a more of a tropical climate. Like where they grow coffee, um, it's, you know, kind of a similar, and cocoa. Yeah. That's the same type of climate that you would, you know, see vanilla beans growing. But the whole thing about growing vanilla, to your point about it being very expensive, they hand pollinate, mm -hmm. I think, every flower for every bean. That's a lot of labor yeah. per bean mm -hmm. that's being done manually. So it, it is a the, very rare food product. Yeah. And the weather in these locations, because of climate change, a few years ago, there was a huge cyclone that went through Madagascar and it destroyed the crop. You saw the prices of vanilla skyrocket. You know, they've come back down, but the vanilla industry, it's really had to regrow since then. Do you know that most of what I know about vanilla was taught to me by Mr. Recipe in the 1990s in New York City? Your buddy, Mr. Recipe. You, Mr. Recipe was this guy. I didn't say was, he is. I mean, I don't know. I haven't seen or heard of him in years, but if you're near Google, Google Mr. Recipe and the word vanilla bean. He was this character, Andrea, like very eccentric with a very like... The mustache. Cool mustache. And I remember the first time I ran into him, it was in the kitchen of Babo. Gina De Palma, the late, great Gina De Palma was the pastry chef there. And he was in there with all of these different vanilla beans. And this guy, his life was centered on vanilla beans. You know, he gave me a kind of a brief history in 20 minutes. But then I would run into him at various times. I'd see him in New York City, like coming out of a subway station, or I'd be walking into restaurant Danielle and he'd be walking out. And he's a he's a he's a character. He's a character. I'm gonna say character. Real uh, interesting fellow. Nice. So I don't know where he is these days. Maybe we'll we'll track him down. Maybe he'll be on the podcast. Yeah, you never know. Another thing I think of when I think about vanilla is years ago I had a very formative meal at Gramercy Tavern. Tom Colicchio was the chef before this is before anybody had ever heard of top chef in fact he was probably not very well known even as being the chef there but he did a dish which i will never forget to me it was so wild at the time it was a sea scallop roasted with almost a, a vanilla emulsion mm. and i remember it had a vanilla bean 
on the plate and almost like this creamy, frothy, this was before you'd ever seen a foam in your life. Yeah. I'm talking like mid 1990s. I, I think uh, scallops lend themselves to sweet. Yep. Like I've seen a lot of scallop dishes with corn. So I think I can understand why they would put vanilla in that scallop dish. I also think with vanilla, I'm thinking about culinary school. I remember my sophomore year at Johnson and Wales, we were tested. We had to make a creme anglaise, which is the base. Um, it can be a sauce, obviously, but you know, you can also turn that creme anglaise into a base for ice cream. It was the first time I had ever really played with fresh vanilla beans and being so kind of excited and inspired. And so I think of creme anglaise, creme brulee, ice cream. Now that you're saying all these things, I'm ha I'm being flooded with like culinary memories of, I actually do use vanilla way more than I even thought. I love to take, make a simple syrup, mm -hmm. add vanilla beans to it, and then poach pears Yum. in the fall. That's like a thing yeah. for me. So this, uh, this episode is going to be killer. Natasha Pickowitz, I don't think I've ever really met her aside from like maybe like waving hello while she was working at uh, Ignacio Matos's Cafe Ultra Paradiso or Bar Flora, but she is really kind of one of the rising star pastry chefs of the United States. And she really knows her stuff about vanilla. I was kind of surprised she immediately wanted to talk about it. And I think it's pretty impressive kind of what she promotes about the vanilla industry. Yeah. So that's going to be a really fun conversation. And then we also have one of the founding family members of Nielsen Massey Vanilla, Wow. Yeah, Beth Nielsen is coming in. That's the vanilla I use at home. When I see a Nielsen Massey in the supermarket, it's not the cheapest, but I will tell you, I always reach for that vanilla extract or a vanilla bean. Or, you know what's really cool? Mm -hmm. Have you seen these vanilla pastes? Like yeah, the purees? we sell it. Those are great. You get the flex and it's a super intense flavor. You know, a little bit goes a long way. It might be expensive, but it's an investment. Yeah. Well, compared to the price of a vanilla bean itself, exactly. I think it's a great value. Yeah. But I think there's something about the quality level of the Nielsen Massey products that They're I reach so for. It. There's a lot of alcohol added to these inferior quality vanillas. And chemicals. It almost gives you like a chemical-y flavor. Yeah. When really you just want to taste that pure vanilla and Nielsen Massey does that. Yeah. You can't be messing with inferior products yeah. when you're making like cookies or whipped cream or anything for that matter. Yeah. So yeah, Nielsen Massey, great partner of the Chef's Warehouse. Going to be a great show. This episode is in partnership with The Chef's Warehouse and produced by Hey Now Media. So Andrea, today we have Natasha Pickowitz here, who is an acclaimed pastry chef. She grew up in San Diego. She's writing a cookbook. Somehow she made it to New York along her journey, which we'll hopefully find out. And now she's here in Westchester, New York with us today. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. We're really pumped up to have you here. Yeah, this um, is awesome. I've been following your Instagram for the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Always exciting and lovely. You were working at Ignacio Matos's Cafe Ultra Paradiso and Flora Bar, which were two of my favorite restaurants um, in New York City. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I opened both of those spaces. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Well, John and I, we wanted you to tell us what you wanted to talk about today. Mm -hmm. um, and you immediately said <laughs> vanilla, yeah, which I was I was actually surprised about. Why is that? I think I mean, I love vanilla and like maybe to a fault, uh, because I think sometimes people like I was Googling vanilla and there was an article about it being, quote unquote, basic what i know yeah, who said that that is and i'm like, like really vanilla bean to me is like to me it's like the primal, standard it's evergreen amazing. right that i think it's like conflating vanilla bean with like pumpkin spice right season. and yes. i'm like okay warming spices so when we're talking about like cinnamon and nutmeg and vanilla these things that are like evocative of fall in like a starbucks way i think yeah that is like a marketing thing and may perhaps overused in certain ways, like pumpkin spice lattes or whatever, like is the drink people want with sweater season. But vanilla is this insanely complex and nuanced ingredient that fascinates me because, because we take it for granted. So when someone says, I think vanilla is basic, to me, what that tells me is they take it for granted because yeah. they actually don't even like understand. I mean, Vanilla. So yeah, I'm obsessed with vanilla. Like vanilla is, 
and and i am too like if, like ice cream for me like if i go to an ice cream shop i'm tasting their vanilla because right. to me that's how i'm like setting the bar because mm -hmm. i want to like see if i if it comes through and you know can you still take the taste the milk the balance i know I'm i was super you. excited when you wanted to talk about vanilla. i'm with you yeah now let's talk about specific vanillas do you have a <sighs> preference tahitian well, versus Madagascar. this is a huge question. Mm -hmm. This is a huge question because, you know, I mean, first of all, like vanilla is a luxury good. How much do you think of vanilla bean costs? Like I asked my boyfriend this this morning and he's like, $80? I was like, okay, wait, no, <laughs> no, I'm the not white quite there. <laughs> but I think that a, because of the way like as you kind of were referencing earlier, the way that vanilla has become this sort of omnipresent thing that we're tasting in almost anything sweet in like American style desserts, you know, and people like Christina Tosi, who's amazing. She's somebody who talks about nostalgia in almost an artificial way. So she's like, buy that clear vanilla imitation extract for when you want to make cupcakes that remind you of your childhood. Vanilla is one of these things where because it's so beloved, products have been made to imitate the real thing. And those are the things mm -hmm. that our palate is like searching for. In like in the eighties, that was what was popular. The imitation vanilla. Right. right. I read that it wasn't until like 2010 that pastry chefs like yourself started to say, no, I want the real thing. Right. I mean, it's such a complicated topic, but vanilla is like the seeds that are harvested from the pod of this like orchid that in some places like Tahiti, they have to be hand pollinated, hand harvested. It's insanely labor intensive. And so, of course, in that like food supply chain, you're running into so many issues around not only like environmental destruction, but like these humanitarian like labor violations also that are really upsetting. You know, just as we're thinking about terroir or like provenance, when we think about things like chocolate, coffee, wine, I think that Western minds aren't quite wrapped their head around the fact that vanilla also comes from certain sort of regions that affect how they taste, how they're grown. You know, Madagascar is the thing that is most ubiquitous to us that we associate with kind of traditional vanilla flavors. But those are like children that are picking the pods, curing them for months selling them to buyers that are then selling them to companies for an insane markup. When we buy vanilla in that way, we're really buying into that chain of abuse to the environment and to communities. But I think that there's very little information about how to purchase more thoughtfully around vanilla, which was always really tricky for me because, you know, when you're working in a restaurant, you're buying massive quantities of these high-end products. And, you know, at places like Flora and Altro, really no expense was spared. It was like the best olive oils from Italy, you know, the best fish from Long Island, like whatever, no cost was spared. That was always paramount. But, you know, man, there's no way to ruin your food costs faster than by spending $600 on vanilla beans because right. you need $600 worth of vanilla beans. There were certain compromises that are getting made along the way. And that was always really difficult for me. Something that is new to me that I'm still learning more about is that Mexico is a underrated producer and exporter of vanilla. When we're thinking about terroir in the vanilla that I've experienced, whether it's the kind of French vanilla from Tahiti to Madagascar to I've had vanilla beans from Hawaii, Mexico, you know, there are different notes, there are different things going on, but the flowers in Mexico are pollinated by bees. It's also easier on the environment and on labor in certain ways too. So learning about all of those things sort of is help inform the way that I want to sort of fold vanilla into my baking and into my work, which is important because it's like one of the best flavors in the world. I also thought it was so interesting that people are like vanilla or chocolate as if it's some sort of like binary. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, how are these things compared? Obviously vanilla, like, right. Right? right? I guess I'm not really like a chocolate person, but. John, are you vanilla or chocolate? <laughs> I love everything. But <laughs> I, I, what I am so fascinated by first, I love your passion about vanilla. Most people just think vanilla, vanilla. Myself, I think, you know, I love using fresh vanilla beans and scraping the pods and stuff. But for you, there's a whole other level of like 
well, you use a different type of vanilla for a different application. It's really wonderful. Definitely. I, mean, I don't think a lot of pastry chefs, they're just like, I need an eight, eight ounce bag of Tahitian vanilla beans. Yeah. And right. they're just like looking at a product in a bag, not like thinking about where it came from, how it was probably less than 10 years ago, the cyclones like devastated Madagascar and the prices skyrocketed. There was a whole thing with theft right? Um, mm. because it's so rare and because they're so hard to grow, you know, people were stealing them. And to your point, and I think that's exactly like it's like nail on the head. There's not enough education. I love this forum right now because I don't think people actually think about that for vanilla. So definitely as a vanilla purist, which I consider you now, mm. will you use extracts? Will you use pastes that have already been taken out? Like you're OK with that kind of stuff? Well, I mean, like like you were saying, I think there's different things for di different different applications. And one of the incredible things about vanilla is how it can bloom or express itself in other things. So whether it's like in an ice cream base, you know, in the way that vanilla will express itself in milk and heavy cream that gets heated and then cooled down. You want to be very intentional with how you're going to use that because that's $40 worth of vanilla bean pods that you're throwing in there. That absolutely matters. And it's also kind of like, how is it going to match with hopefully the kind of dairy that you're buying too has its own personality and its own unique notes. And you want all those things to sort of match and go together. So those were definitely the kind of things I was thinking about when I'm making gelato or when I'm applying heat to anything. But then you're thinking about like baked goods and you're kind of like, well, you know, a chocolate chip cookie isn't going to taste the same unless it has vanilla extract in it. Right. And so you're thinking about, OK, well, these sort of liquids are going to make more sense in a wheat based pastry than in something that is a liquid already. There's a lot of trial and error, experimentation. And I think like you, you do want to kind of be intentional with what you're using and how you're using it. And things like the gels or vanilla bean caviar that's like suspended in like a thick Right. Gel might mm -hmm. not be the right paste. Like a paste. A yeah. paste, a paste mm -hmm. almost, yeah. Or a compound. Yeah. Like those are great too. Mm -hmm. yeah. There are vanilla bean powders you can buy. My favorite vanilla bean purveyor is Halala, which is Tongan. Their vanilla is extraordinary. Even more important in the like almost 20 years now that they've been a company, they actively work with the communities. They're one of the few vanilla bean sellers that actively is working with farmers and the growers, the heart, like, it's like a fair trade kind of setup. Yeah, cool. it's a much more holistic way at looking at how to build a community around this economy um, on this small island off the coast of New Zealand. And the product is exquisite. Awesome. I mean, yes, it costs an arm and a leg, but it's kind of like there are certain things where I'm like, I want the best. Like, I want the best butter. I want organic sugar. Like, I want great milk. Those things express themselves in the final product, you know, and it's worth it for me. But they also have really fun flavored vanilla extracts, which was new to me. They like have what? a cocoa powder flavored one. They have like a coffee extract. Those are fun things to play around with too. Mm -hmm. But I always tell people like, you know, you can start playing around with the extracts first. And then when you want to like get crazy, start playing around with buying beans. When somebody describes another person as being vanilla, that means boring, right? Or right. bland. But I really, I really think, feel like it's the opposite. It's just Natasha, so interesting. If Natasha says you're vanilla, I'm like, you're that's the highest super compliment. Interesting. Yeah, you're hot. <laughs> Exactly. That's great. So for people at home, when they buy vanilla beans, because they're expensive, I mean, I cringe when I look at a supermarket and you see like that test tube yep. and it's got one in there for like $25. I'm like... And it also yeah. looks like very shriveled. Well, and like, it depends. Yeah. Sometimes they look plump, but... A lot of times yeah, they do I, look sure. What it, what should the home consumer look like? I think you look for in the bean. You're right, Andrea. Well, yeah. you see them shriveled. Is that a bad sign? I mean, again, it depends on where it was grown, right? And also there are like grades of vanilla too. And I think the majority of the vanilla that we buy is like what you're describing, kind of a more desiccated appearance. But again, it's also the region. Like I think Tahitian vanilla 
the pods are really glossy. They feel kind of greasy to the touch. That's why it's so expensive. Mm -hmm. It's like it has like a lot of the caviar on the inside. But the thing is, you can buy something that seems kind of desiccated, but it can still be used for so many things as well. Can you store it? I used to, when I would buy large amounts, I would put it in sugar. Is that like a wives tale or is that a good thing to do? I mean, well, yeah. anything it touches, it's going to infuse. Mm -hmm. I love it in salt also. You can ah, do it in salt. That's really cool. Um, yeah. Um, you know, you can bury it in things like polenta and things like rice, make rice pudding with it. Like mm. it inf will infuse anything it comes into contact with. You can make your own vanilla extract by putting the beans it's inside alcohol. alcohol. Exactly. And, or just drink it. <laughs> yeah. Vanilla drink. Vanilla drink. I don't know. You know, because for certain things like at Flora, we had like a vanilla bean sable where we would like scrape the caviar and you could see the flecks mm -hmm. of the bean in the buttery cookie. I mean, it's like my favorite cookie of all time. Then we would have all these pods left over and I'm like, we can't throw these away. They're like so special. So you can also like dehydrate them, grind it up into a powder or yeah, you can put it in with coffee. I mean, there's so many ways to sort of like extend that lifespan of that bean so that you're really getting value for your more bang for your buck. So if you're not using Halela, yes. do you like Nielsen Massey? Do you like, what is your... Yeah, Nielsen Massey is great. Yeah, not cheap. No, but, but very high quality. Yeah, and that's something where you can, that you know, Whole Foods has it. Mm -hmm. Like my Sea town has it. You know, that's something that you can find in like those bigger kind of retail spaces. But I would encourage people to get online and like also order directly from some of these companies too and, you know, get those things just like shipped to your home. Yeah. Now that I'm home baking, I'm kind of mixing it up all the time now because like I'll be buying smaller quantities of things and I'm always kind of curious to see what else is out there. And know? it's so versatile. I mean, you can use it in savory mm -hmm. applications. It sounds like you put it in almost anything possibly. Do you have anything that are like your go-to favorites? Like, I have to have the best vanilla in this dish to make it shine. I was actually just talking to Brooks Headley about this, you know, at Superiority Burger, and he was telling me that the guys from Burlap and Barrel gave him a bean that they're not selling yet. I think it's like a very early, I'm not sure how far along they are in developing it or if it's something that they're eventually going to sell. But he said he used like one tenth of the bean to flavor like 10 quarts of an ice cream base and that it was like so extreme he kind of but we what we ended up having was a very interesting conversation about pulling back and using it less too and I think that I love it so much perhaps it's like I can get more heavy handed with it I'll be making something and without even thinking I'm kind of like dashing it in sometimes I have to kind of pull myself out of that and be like does this jam need to have this note in it? Or is this going to get lost because I'm also throwing in all these other things? And it's almost kind of like when I add like pinches of salt to things, I'm just like shaking it in. So I think it's also just as important to think about pulling back, kind of thinking of it as a spice or an ingredient where you really want it to shine or to be highlighted. So like at Ultra, we did like a I did like a vanilla uh, bourbon one, which is a classic pairing because you're thinking about the warmth of vanilla and how um, and, and other warm spirits like whiskey, bourbon, rye, like those rum, these things all play so well together. So I love, yeah, also vanilla with booze, I think. Yeah. So very fun. I first met Brooks when he was the pastry chef at Del Posto many moons ago, maybe not that many moons ago. Um, but then he left and started Superiority Burger, which was a vegan burger concept and obviously his background was heavily in pastry and he's still rocking and rolling in the east village there it's amazing to hear about all of these things with the vanilla and i want to you know we've been talking a lot about floor bar and outro paradiso um but you left last year in 2020 um, or was it earlier this year i was i mean not to get into like the semantics of yeah. it, but, uh, you know, I think left indicates like agency around that move. Yeah. I was permanently terminated. So you, okay. So you were terminated because of the pandemic. Something that I saw last March of 2020, immediately following the shutdowns is in the years leading up to the COVID, at least through my perspective, pastry in New York was having this like amazing moment. And perhaps it was because I was interacting so much with so many of my colleagues. I was doing this like bake sale for Planned Parenthood. I felt like 
the pastry community had so many dynamic connections. There were so many interesting things being made. Their work was being evaluated and sort of looked at in ways that I felt like perhaps people are starting to give them a similar weight to their savory counterparts. And it was all very so exciting to be in New York and to get recognition from James Beard for nominated for my work at Flora for three years in a row. You know, like that was extremely validating. And I what happened with COVID, restaurant operators are scrutinizing their staff, streamlining operations. What's the first thing to go? Pastry's not essential, you know, so to speak. I mean, I would disagree with that statement about pastry not being essential, Mm -hmm. but I... But we did hear a lot about that, like that sentiment. Oh, we saw it happen. Yeah. I mean, you're living proof that this was a place where pandemic hits, you know, the shit hits the fan. An operator feels like they got to make changes. I think it's a mistake. It was awful. Like it was devastating. You know, I had, like I'd said, I had open ultra, I had open floor. I had been at those places for almost five years. Um, had given those places everything, done the bake sales, built up these teams, had created this repertoire. Obviously, what happened to me is not unique to me. Almost all of my friends who are pastry chefs, pastry cooks, teams eliminated pastry chefs without jobs. A lot of the, those restaurants still to this day have not reinstated pastry chefs. Of course, there are places now that have since opened, reopened, have pastry teams, doing incredible things, whatever. Unfortunately, I was not a part of what that was. And you didn't see this coming. You were I mean, kind of at the top of your world. No one saw yeah. it. You were rocking it. No one saw it coming. Yeah, for sure. I gave myself a little time to feel sorry for myself and be really sad. And in the grand scheme of things, I was insanely lucky. Like I was safe in my apartment. I was okay financially. Like sure. what was the turning point? In the wake of COVID, all of these insane changes, restrictions, death, these like social justice moments, like there's just so many intense things happening. So, you know, you kind of really learn who is there to support you, who, you know, wants to help you, who is in your corner, like who's in your community, like who those people are. And that was really profound for me. People like Brooks reaching out and being like, hey, we're closed this many days a week. Do you want to like come in and do something? Like, do you want to just like mess around in here to offer that generosity, to open their door to you? The practice, the physicality of making things was the thing that sustained me. You know, it got me out of my apartment. It got me into a little kitchen where I was baking alone. You know, I wasn't with other people, but I was also not in my studio apartment losing my mind. So it was like your therapy. Totally. And I was just like, for like six hours, I'm out of my head. I'm not living in anxiety land. And I'm like making brioche and I'm baking off focaccia and I'm making layer cakes. And it's just like, ah, you get a break from yourself, you know, but you're also making things, giving them to people, feeding them. And I think also in those early moments of the pandemic, those treats, I think, had a very powerful feeling behind them of like connecting you to people, of giving people a little bit of joy. That's like a little bit extra. Um, And that feeling of feeding people I had missed also from working in restaurants. And so that also felt really powerful. So that was kind of where the pop-up started. But kind of dovetailing with all of that was this book proposal that I had been working on. And I had actually met my book agent the fall before of 2019. So while I was still employed and working in restaurants, the language and the storytelling of the book proposal was all about the restaurants. It was like about the Italian ingredients that I was using. It was about working inside of a museum. It was about the bake sales. It was about my pastry team, you know, and it was so informed by what I was going through in that moment. And then I lost my job and I was like, I can't write this book anymore. Like this is, you know, doesn't make sense anymore. Like this isn't my life anymore. And my agent was kind of like, no rush, but when you are ready, this could be a great time for you to work on your proposal. And she's like, "I let's change the feeling and the tone behind this book. Like, let's make this book all about you. Let's make it about your family, you know, and we really together articulated this proposal that felt to me infinitely more connected with who I am as like a pastry chef. The reason why I bake, it brought me closer to my family. And that actually was like an incredible blessing. You yeah. know, I was like, oh, I'm writing the book that I didn't think I deserved to write. Yeah, but it's I didn't the honest think... story. What's the name of the book? 
Well, I um, I don't know if I should say quite yet because it's still a working title and okay. it might change. But when I was reading your bio, I found it so interesting that you didn't actually get into baking until you were in your 20s. Yeah, like my late 20s. I studied Scottish lit at Cornell. I wanted to get into journalism. I actually worked in radio for a few years. I worked at WVBR, which is like the Cornell radio station where like Keith Olbermann worked. Nice. And cool. Yeah. And I was a programmer there and did radio in Montreal. But, you know, I got my first baking job in Montreal because I needed to work somewhere that would pay me under the table. And we all know that like that's where the restaurant industry is definitely like finding a lot of people to work. And um, I just fell in love with the practice. Like I had never, I cooked a lot at home kind of for friends, but never had baked in any kind of like organized way. Like I grew up my mom making like Chinese food and there's not a really big dessert or sweets culture in Chinese cooking. So it just wasn't really like something that I grew up around or grew up craving. Like my palate is very savory. Mm -hmm. I'm always craving more salty than sweet. But I think it was more like the act of making things, like the technique and the process and this idea of like being on your feet and making stuff with your hands. It's very different than cooking where you're kind of making something start to finish, for example, in like 15 minutes. This was more like the planning and engineering. You know, it's all very good for my brain. So no professional cooking school. You went to an Ivy League university. No cooking school. And people... Crossed the border to Canada. But then young. you lied to get the job, right? That, <laughs> yeah. I thought that was so great. Oh, I didn't hear that. But don't we all lie to get those jobs that we want? I'm always like, fake it till you make it, you know? Yeah. And I felt that way when I was hired at Ultra. Do I feel ready to like do this job? Like, can I open a restaurant? Like, I've never done that before. Do I know how to make ice cream? I was like, you know what? Whatever. I'm just going to figure it out while I'm doing it. And I have to just believe that that will happen. So I was like, yeah, I've worked in restaurants and no. And then I was like, but I can follow a recipe. Like I can figure this out. I mean, it wasn't perfect, but I learned so much. So. Well, it was pretty damn good. I went to Flora Bar with Ina Garten for lunch one day with a couple of friends. Oh my God. I remember I that. You, she, we were all blown away, but she was blown away to the point where she invited you to do a show with that. Her. That I remember that day exactly like I remember what she was wearing. I'm not joking. And then she came back later with Michael Ian Black and his wife. And I was like, I don't know what this double date is, but I'm obsessed with this. <laughs> but I think he had a podcast and they had had her on as a guest or something. But when you guys had come in, my whole pastry team, we were like a flutter because, you know, she's so wonderful and she really embodies this like very approachable aesthetic that's also very like elegant and very thoughtful you know so when she came in and you know when we were opening flora there was just this like parade of people that i had always dreamed about feeding you know like martha had come in and she'd said that flora was her favorite restaurant in manhattan and that was like mind-blowing like ruth reichel had come in and she tweeted about the endive salad and i almost passed out like it was just so exciting and then ina came in and i was like let's you know because we have Flora Coffee at the time, which was like the little coffee shop where we had all of the pastries that we'd sell to like museum patrons and stuff mm -hmm. during the day. And at the end of the day, we would pack up the leftovers into boxes and give them to you know, guests or like friends or people we liked or whatever, which was something that we did when I worked at Marlowe and Sons, we would pack up the counter and like give people goodie bags on their way out. Right. So I was like, let's give Ina that goodie bag. <laughs> the next day I got an email and she was like thanking me for these pastries. And I was just like, this is it surreal. Made, it was Pinch totally, yeah. yeah. She's a sweet woman. Incredible. Yeah. Your pastries were amazing. And then she invited me on her show and it was like a dream come true. True. That's awesome. Yeah. You know, it's great. another thing I want. You mentioned your Chinese heritage and I mentioned your Instagram earlier. I was looking at your Instagram and I saw that you did a BYOD, a bring your own dessert to Wu's Wonton King. Mm -hmm. And I'm obsessed with Wu's Wonton You keep talking King. about Wu's Wonton this King. This is like my new yeah. thing. I'll, I find a restaurant in New York that I like. And then I just go there continuously. Yeah. And the menu is so perfect that you can go with any number of people and any kind of quantity and order different things. And they're all like completely it's stunning. It's so good. Yeah. Kate John Prater, was talking yeah. about the uh, scrambled eggs with shrimp. Yeah. Have classic. you had that? It's, uh, not is it there, a classic but... or is that like, I've never heard of that. When I saw it on your Instagram, John, I was like, what is this? this I think is... a lot of people don't think about 
how eggs can like figure into Chinese food. Mm -hmm. But like, yeah, you're going to see scrambled eggs with seafood, scrambled eggs with like tomatoes. Like, yeah, classic. I don't know what they put in those scrambled eggs. <laughs> Magic. They, they the flavor is so crazy good. First of all, if you think if you just add some rice to it, you got shrimp fried rice. But if you're listening and you're anywhere near New York, go to Wu's Wonton King. It's that good. Classic. And yeah. their wonton soup is insane. It's just like an industry fave because you know the BYO thing means that you can you know bring. Yeah, so I, that's why I'm bringing this up. I didn't realize you could bring your own dessert, which is amazing. I, I mean, mean I who know knows? You <laughs> I don't know. Who could say? Yeah. Um, what are typical Chinese? desserts well that's the thing is like you know you you have i think more the tradition is you have these like sumptuous involved decadent savory feasts and then the way you finish your meal is with perhaps like sliced fresh fruit mm -hmm. or you know like at woos you get like a little piece of the mango jelly it's like something simple to clean the palate to kind of just end that meal on like a very light note growing up my mom liked to serve like you know uh, dessert soups, you know, like these kind of warmed kind of brothy soups with either like um, red beans floating in it or like a mochi balls, like that kind of thing. Would you incorporate any of that into the work that you were doing professionally? Um, in the restaurants, not so much mm -hmm. because I don't know how much that, I mean, I, I think you can play around with ingredients in any way that you want, like into a restaurant, if it makes sense with the menu. But I find myself playing around with it more now doing on my own, like doing my own pop up, you know, and playing around with like the kind of layer cakes, gelatos, cookies, kind of savory things um, that I'm selling at my pop ups, but bringing in these kind of flavors that maybe didn't fit in at like a menu like an Italian restaurant like Altro or at a place right. like Flora. So, you know, I had like a, a brown butter blondie with an adzuki bean swirl, you right. know, and, and sort of thinking, I think a lot of Western palates don't think about beans as like a dessert ingredient, but they have like a starchy, savory uh, richness that I think makes a lot of sense with things like, yeah, like a, a blondie, you know? Um, so, yeah, I think I'm I'm trying to like delve into that more, I think, and, and really enjoying thinking about those things now free of sort of a restaurant context where right. you're thinking about like a cohesive menu. What is that like for a pastry chef when you go and you work at a restaurant? Is the chef telling you, you know, the, I'm saying the savory chef or, you know, when you're there, Ignacio, are they saying like, we want you to do this or do you kind of have free reign to with your creativity and working at places like Altro and flora that was a relationship that changed in some ways a lot over time so of course like the first year i was there it was like people being like i want this i want a panna cotta on the menu we need to have chocolate sorbet there needs to be this but i think like over time my experience grew my palate improved. My confidence bit was built in certain ways. I kind of figured out ways to have some kind of autonomy within writing a menu, hiring people, ordering ingredients, whatever that looked like. I advocated for that for myself. But at the end of the day, you're working for someone. Right. You're you're filling someone else's vision. You're meeting someone else's bottom line. You're you're working for someone. I was an employee. Like so in that way I, you have no agency. But I think like hopefully in a restaurant where someone you know, knows your worth or what you bring to the table, they're there to nurture you and let you be like creative in the ways that, you know, they know you can thrive. Yeah. So in to a certain extent, I was able to do that. And that was, and that was really exciting, you know, and being able to be like, think of a dessert, kind of work on it, present it to someone, you know, you still have to get the like, you know, like approval or whatever. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Do you think you want to come back to <laughs> restaurants or do a bake shop or do you want to be a book writer, TV personality? Like what's, yeah. what's the future? That's a really interesting question. I'm getting offers. People are constantly asking me to, you know, whether it's to like consult or maybe come on as pastry chef. And like the reason why I wanted to open Ultra and Flora was I was like, Estelle is the best restaurant in New York City. Like I want to work in these best places where I'm going to learn and grow and like evolve. And so I think that whatever I do next has to play off of that feeling as well of like wanting to continue to grow and evolve. And I'm watching what's happening and there's definitely some really exciting things happening. But fortunately, doing this pop up 
is a way for me to stay connected to restaurants, to businesses, and in, in a very small way, like Yellow Rose in the East Village, Four Horsemen in Williamsburg, Superiority Burger, Tea Company, um, Kismet in LA. Like these are places where I'm like, these places are awesome. The people who work here are incredible. They're supportive. They're generous. Their guests who come in are lovely. You know, like this is a way for me to still participate in the industry, but like in a very pared back way. And, and the places you mention are also kind of the best places and the hot spots right now. So, good. so I mean, it, I think it speaks to the fact that socially they're doing the right things. Um, sourcing wise, as you mentioned, they're doing the right things and the cream rises to the top in some regard. I always feel that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, the, you know, they're seeing the positive outcomes. How do the listeners of this program, how do they know where you're doing your pop-ups? Yeah, I'm definitely going to do some stuff this fall. I'm working on a website. doesn't exist yet, but soon. For now, my Instagram is really the best way to find out. So my Instagram is just my name, Natasha Pickowitz. Um, I'll post about things that I'm doing. I have one final thought here. That is that we all go to Woo's Wonton King. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you bring some desserts with us. Done. Let's do it. Love I mean, to. like I, you bring the wine. I'll bring the wine. Mm -hmm. Done right. deal. Great. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. This is a great awesome conversation. conversation. We're excited. We're, we're, you're going to have to come back when the book is ready to come out. Or, I'd love to. Or before, whatever, mm -hmm. because we want to know what's going on I'll in the life of another. Natasha Pickowitz. Yeah, keep <laughs> us posted. Cool. Thank you, guys. This episode is sponsored by Nielsen Massey a great partner of the Chef's Warehouse and one of the finest vanilla producers in the world. Well, we're so excited, Andrea. Um, on the line with us today is Beth Nielsen of Nielsen Massey Vanilla. She's a, a vanilla legend, or her family is a vanilla legend. Thanks for being here, Beth. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, Nielsen Massey, how it started, the history? I know it's um, over 100 years old, the company, right? 1907. So we're based out of uh, outside of Chicago. Where we are now is in Waukegan, which is about 20, 30 miles north of Chicago, but started south of Chicago. And then when I was a kid and visiting my, my dad working there, we were actually downtown on Webster. We were there for oof, at least 60 years um, in Chicago. And then uh, we moved to Lake Forest and now we're in Waukegan because my dad expanded it and uh, had vision, so. And has the family always been in the vanilla business? Because obviously vanilla is a, you know, a tropical growing plant. Yeah, how did they get started, you know, kind of bringing that tropical plant to Chicago? Vanilla is grown um, in it's very similar to cacao and uh, and coffee. So it's about 10 degrees above and below the equator. We started out as a flavor business. And then it was really my my grandfather and uh, my dad moved it into the vanilla. If anybody goes on my web website, you can you can see there are pictures of my grandfather and Massey in Mexico growing vanilla beans. Where does Nielsen Massey source most of their beans? Is there one area in particular? Obviously, there's a difference between the Tahitian versus Madagascar bourbon versus other, you know, the other style of vanilla? Well, there's a, there's a difference in the flavor profile. As far as our sourcing, uh, about 70% of all vanilla comes out of Madagascar, but it originated in Mexico. So when I am cooking and I'm using any spice, which I like all the time, I'm using Mexican. But the Tahitian is, is very floral, very, you know, fruity. I mean, think about Tahiti, right? If you've ever been there. Um, but it's botanical. And so I use that in the summer with fruits all the time, the Tahitian. The Ugandan is really interesting because it has a chocolate note because I also know there's, you know, some chocolate. So it's all about thinking about what is grown in the earth 
of where you are getting everything and it all comes together in a beautiful way. Has that always kind of been the standard for Nielsen Massey to, you know, source the best? Um, because I think the brand, especially for, you know, our Chef's Warehouse customers, um, you know, people ask for it by name. What makes Nielsen Massey the superior vanilla that's out there? The best vanilla beans in the world, the top grade, as well as our process is very, very important. We have a cold ex extraction process. It takes us three to five weeks, even though it's taken three to five years for the best vanilla beans to be produced and cultivated. Every competitor is doing it in three to five days because they're adding heat or pressure. So what is a cold extraction? What is that process exactly? So it's alcohol, sugar, 72 degrees, purely. I, I've explained it to some people. If, if you're making a cup of coffee, can you imagine not adding heat to make a cup of coffee? Got it. What are some of the products in addition to obviously just vanilla beans that Nielsen Massey sells? Okay. My favorite one, I work with a lot of chefs, is the paste. So our paste, it's better in so many ways because you don't have to scrape the vanilla bean. So you don't have the labor intensivity. You're just literally unscrewing a cap. So we, you know, more or less created that. Uh, about 15, 20 years ago, you can get the specs. So you have the aesthetic. I wouldn't use it for everything, but when you want to make a creme brulee, for instance, or mm -hmm. I love it. I use most of our products in savory, ironically. That's cool. A lot of chefs refer to that, you know, the inside seeds as kind of the caviar of mm -hmm. the vanilla bean. So when with this paste, it's a hundred percent, just the inside seeds and and pulp, so to speak, of the vanilla bean? We're, we're ba the seeds are just for the aesthetic, and they're from our vanilla beans. So we're also recycling, and we've been doing that for a long time. So we're recycling the seeds and putting them in, uh, in the paste, but the flavor is coming from everything else we make. What's on the horizon for Nielsen Massey? You guys said that you're you know, into flavors? Are there any new flavors that you're working on or anything um, interesting that you're doing with vanilla? Mm, we have almond and chocolate and coffee. And there are so many great extracts that we also are creating. We're constantly innovating. I've had a long list for a long time of, uh, of new flavors. We've been really delving into the organic line. I have um, a brewer who's doing some great stuff in Colorado. They're using our vanilla for brewing their beer. Uh, I have a lot of savory chefs all over the world that are using it in barbecue, any protein that you're doing, whether grilling or once it starts getting colder, if you have to do it in the oven, but just like slap a little paste on it and and it makes a poppy yo. I don't know if you know that, but you know, like well, we really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. It's, it's obviously a very intricate uh, business, and you guys are doing some really great stuff. Great partner of Chefs Warehouse and, and pastry chefs around the country. So thank you so much. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Ingredient Insiders, where chefs talk. Like what you hear, write us a review, and follow us on Instagram at Ingredient Insiders. Don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts.